Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you tuned in today. This is Kathy from Divergent Church in Queanbeyan. And we're doing a series at the moment on the names of Jesus. Last week, Kieran talked about Jesus, the light of the world from the Gospel of John. And he encouraged us to spend some time this week looking into the Gospel of John and reading uh, through that book a little bit more. And I've been doing that and studying a bit and learning some stuff about that gospel that I didn't know before. You know, it's structured quite differently from the other three gospels, probably written a little bit later. And it's actually full of symbolism that, that really inspires uh, to, to see who Jesus is. John has this passion for the number seven. And you find this out right in the very first chapter of John. When Jesus is introduced, he's given seven different titles, Lamb of God, Son of God, Rabbi, Son of Man, Messiah, King of Israel, and Jesus of Nazareth. It kind of acts as a little bit of a prompt to watch out for sevens in this book. There are seven I am statements in John's Gospel. So just from last week, I am the light of the world, said Jesus. And I am the bread of life, which we'll look at today. There are seven of those statements. And that phrase, I am, is really significant. And the Jewish people would have immediately recognised the echo back to Exodus 3.14, where God speaks to Moses out of the burning bush and says, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And so when Jesus says, I am, in various different ways, there's an immediate recognition that he is uh, relating himself back to God. John is also very selective about the miracles he chooses to talk about Jesus. He, he chooses six particular miracles and calls them signs. And once again, he invites you to start counting those signs. He starts with the miraculous um, transformation of water into wine at the wedding in Cana. And at the end of that story, he says this was the first sign that Jesus performed to reveal his glory. And the second is the healing of the nobleman's son at Capernaum. And John again says this, is, this was the second sign. And then he leaves you to count up the others. Um, there's the healing of the paralysed man at the pool, the multiplication of the bread and the fish, the healing of the man born blind, and then in the climax of John's Gospel, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And so there are these six key miracles that John selects to make his point, to make his case about who Jesus is. And if you read N.T. Wright, you'll, he'll say, you'll see that he says that, that John presents these six signs which lead us to the foot of the cross, where we realise that the lifting up of Jesus on the cross is the seventh sign that reveals God's glory. So why the number seven? Well, seven is the number of completeness and wholeness in Hebrew. God's creative process, the original creation of the world, is told in a series of seven days. And seven days sets the rhythm for life for God's people, six days of work and one day of rest. So what John is saying in a very symbolic way here is that Jesus is completely aligned with God's completion and God's perfection. And he's also saying, look, there's a new creation happening here. God created the world originally in seven episodes. Now through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, he's recreating his broken world and forming a new creation, which begins on the first day of the week with the rising of Jesus from the dead. It's a very inspiring and encouraging picture. The first part of the book of John, the first section of the book of John also follows a predictable pattern. 
you see uh, that Jesus does something or says something that causes a big controversy. There's a lot of discussion about the significance and the meaning of that. And at the end of that controversy, people are asked to make a choice. Who is this Jesus? So today I want to look at one of those seven wonderful I am statements where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So the context here of this story uh, is Jesus feeding the 5,000. It's one of these signs that, that John is highlighting that reveals God's glory in Jesus. And you see um, the sign the action that Jesus performed, followed by a long controversy uh, discussing the significance of that. So Jesus feeds the 5,000 and then he kind of um, slips away under cover of darkness and the crowd go looking for him. And I'm going to read from verse 26 of John chapter 6. You might like to follow. John 6 verse 26. Then Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, that the Son of Man will give you. Then they asked him, well, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, well, what sign will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. At this point, it's a bit infuriating because um, you wonder why didn't the people recognise the sign that had already been given, the miraculous feeding? Well, to give the people that crowd credit, if you read that whole passage where, where Jesus breaks the bread and multiplies the bread, they did say, ah, he must be the prophet. Ah, he must be that, that prophet that was mentioned in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, verse 15. You might remember from back in our Deuter Deuteronomy series where it says, you know, God will raise up another prophet from amongst you. You must listen to him. And these people were oppressed by the Roman government and they remembered how Moses stood up to the oppressive uh, regime of Pharaoh and they were probably thinking if only Jesus was like Moses, if he is this prophet, then he will stand up to Caesar and remove this oppression from our lives. And, and you know, at the end it says the crowd were looking for Jesus because they wanted to make him king by force. So you can see this thinking process. What they didn't understand was that this bread from heaven, this Jesus, is far greater than Moses. And so the controversy goes on in verse 32. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then here comes the punchline. In verse 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And from verse 41, at this the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling amongst yourselves, Jesus answered. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life and I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. So I want to talk about this key verse, verse 35, 
where Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. I want to talk about three aspects. I want to talk about how eating the bread of heaven is related and is a part of believing. I want to talk about how the bread of heaven satisfies. And I want to talk about how the bread of heaven gives us a reason to celebrate. So let's look at this connection then between eating and believing. From verse 47, where Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. There's the believing. Then he says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert, in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. So the first part where he's talking about believing is the bit that we get. You know, we understand we're good Bible believing Protestants and we understand it's not by good works, but only by faith that we are saved. So that bit, that bit makes sense to us. But then Jesus goes on to describe what believing is like and he connects believing and eating. So believing doesn't just exist in a disconnected mental box up here somewhere. There is something about the believing life that's like eating. There's a beautiful line in the Anglican communion service where, you know, after the leader offers the, the communion bread, the leader will say, feed on Christ in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. I think there's something very beautiful about that. That, that I'm trying to communicate here in this relationship, believing and eating. You know, believing, of course, it does involve turning your mind to something and thinking about it, but it's not just agreeing with certain doctrines. It's not just some nice theological idea that we take out on Sunday. You know, nor is it some list um, of statements that we tick off and we get some kind of digital passport that we can put on our phone so that when we get to the gates of heaven, we can go, yep, I can get in. Now, I think Jesus is saying believing is more like ingesting a life-giving substance. So bread, of course, was a staple food for many cultures. And bread energised, provided the food for every activity and every facet of life. So this believing, this eating the bread from heaven is also about incorporating Jesus into all of my life. This life of God's people in the wilderness kind of revolved around, you know, going, collecting the manna, eating the manna every day. Believing in the Messiah is also about a life that involves connecting to him. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that if I didn't feed on Jesus today, then I'm no longer saved. No, no, no. Of course, God gives us the gift of his spirit as a seal, guaranteeing our salvation when we repent of sin and accept Jesus by faith. We get that spirit as a seal of salvation. You know, that's what we learnt just before in our previous series in the Holy Spirit. But what Jesus is saying here is talking about an ongoing life of believing. Jesus wants to be a real and tangible presence in our day-to-day -day life. And believing in him and feeding on him every day is meant to go together. So what does that mean for me? Well, at the moment, a large portion of my week is spent at work. So being a believer at work means I'm connecting to Jesus. I'm inviting him into that sphere of my life and asking him, Lord, would you help me in this area? And as I feed on him daily, he helps me to reflect his integrity in the workplace. He helps me to care 
more and more for the people that I work with. And I don't do that perfectly, but I seek the bread of heaven to, to feed me and build me up so that I become um, more like him in that place. And I don't know what you spend your week doing. Maybe you're studying, maybe you're raising children, um, maybe you're working as well or any combination of those things. And maybe your life is really busy. But Jesus still wants to be a part of that. He wants to be your bread that energizes you for life every day. He who comes to me will never go hungry. So Jesus doesn't want to be disconnected from my every day, but he wants me, he wants to be connected into whatever I'm doing. His kingdom has already invaded the kingdom of this world. And the bread of heaven has come down to us to help us and feed us. Secondly, this bread of heaven fills us. He who comes to me will never get hungry, says Jesus. You know, coming to Jesus in faith is coming to him and saying, I am not enough. My efforts are not enough. The food that I've worked for in the past whether that's success or achievement or recognition or working to make perfect relationships or romance or wealth, all these things that I work for easily spoil. These things in the end of themselves don't satisfy. Believing in Jesus is saying everything else I have tried has left me hungry. Every other source has left me empty. I need the bread of life. He will stop me once and for all from being hungry. And coming to Jesus is about saying, as I believe by living in you, you will be enough. And because you are enough, I become enough. And this is the point that's really spoken to me um, over the last week as I've been uh, reading and meditating on this passage, you know, because there are things that draw me away, things that stop Jesus being enough. And the big one for me is comparison. I can easily have my gaze turned towards comparing with others and um, being drawn away from that simple reliance on Jesus. And I figure out what comparison is. It's trying in my own efforts to be good enough, trying in my own efforts to compete with the people I see around me. And the problem with that is that I get hungry. I get hungry again when I do that. Thankfully, the bread of heaven always welcomes me back and always says, come back, Kathy, come and feed on me because I will fill you and then you will be enough. And, and that's been a great joy this week, reflecting on that and realising that as I feed on Jesus, he is enough and I become enough regardless of my circumstances. Keeping in mind that this food is not a food that removes every discomfort. You know, just as Jesus suffered, partaking of this bread of life also involves partaking of suffering, like the Apostle Paul said, I bear in my body the death of Jesus, that the life of Jesus might also be revealed. But in the midst of the brokenness of this world, whilst we wait for God's final restoration, he is enough. He, prote he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He satisfies me regardless of my circumstances. Thirdly, the bread of heaven is an invitation to celebrate. As I said, John only selects six miracles to reveal who Jesus is. One of them is about making great wine and one of them is about making great food. And there are beautiful echoes here to the promises in the prophets about what God is going to do to restore all things. Let me read to you from Isaiah 25. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. 
He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces and he will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. Isaiah 25. And then a couple of hundred years later, Jesus turns up and Jesus is making great wine and he's making beautiful food. Can you see the connection? Yes, of course, God has not yet swallowed up death forever. We know that only too well. But in Jesus, we see the promise becoming a reality already. His resurrection life is the beginning point for the renewal of of the earth, for all of creation. And the cool thing is this, by the power of his spirit, he invites us to demonstrate that new kingdom, that new presence in the world. And that is such a great reason to celebrate. We get to share the bread of heaven with others. This rich food from heaven is already available and we get to start to hand it out. You know, my life, com, um, we were stuck, of course, like everyone, on Zoom for a while. And then when the restrictions began to ease, uh, we started planning for our first dinner together, um, sharing together and praying for each other after doing some of the Alpha videos. And one of my group members, Emma, was practically uh, exploding out of her little Zoom box with excitement, saying, I'm going to cook for you guys. You can come to my house and we're going to have a great time of fellowship together. And I just was thinking about her excitement and um, I was thinking about, yeah, that's what it should be like when we get together to celebrate the bread of heaven and we eat together, physically eat together as a symbol of, you know, the bread of heaven coming and our looking forward to the fulfilment of all things. Um, That's such a reason to celebrate every time we meet together. And so I want to finish by encouraging you guys, whilst we now have the freedom again to meet together, to celebrate Jesus, the bread of heaven, as we come together in community and just realise the significance of it as we share a meal together and then also share spiritual food together together. in a, in a moment of celebration. And as we bring people in to share that with us, we get to minister the bread of heaven um, to all those, all those that we connect with. I am the bread of life, says Jesus. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. He wants to be part of our life. The bread of heaven wants to come in and fill us and satisfy us and remind us of what is to come, the great fulfilment and the great feast that's lined up for us once all things are restored. So I pray this week you will really reflect on the bread of heaven and experience um, that intimacy with him this week. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you that you have come down and that you are our bread. I pray, Lord Jesus, for every person listening today, wherever they're at, If they feel empty today, I pray, Jesus, your bread would be there and they would take and eat of you and find that you are the one who truly satisfies. In Jesus' name, amen. May you feed on Christ in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving this week. Thanks a lot. See you later. Send me a message if you want to chat. Bye.